Hello there, and happy Friday to you. Thank you, folks, for joining me today. Love to have you here stopping by the podcast. And oh, is it a good one today. Two excellent guests. Normally on Friday, we have Finnegan Friday's Christian Finnegan, but he was out in San Francisco doing the stand-up comedy for a, a private gig. It sounds like good cash, hopefully. Private gigs are always great for comedians and he went out to northern california and so uh instead i got his wife how about that i've been trying to get in touch with and interview cambry cruz who's been on the show before to talk about covid and how it affected live venues and live performance because she owns a place in in queens that christian often references qed anyway cambry is now running for town council at this small town in upstate New York where she and Christian have this little one-bedroom cabin up there. He's running for office. We had a wonderful conversation about all that she's overcome and all that she's accomplished and why she's running and what it's like to run. I think you're really going to like my conversation with Cambria Cruz. And before that, I've got author and journalist David Daly, who is really quickly becoming one of my favorite political analyst. He's also real good at talking about politics and recalling all kinds of legal and political issues and times and people. And I just love talking to him. Super smart guy who has written two excellent books, uh, Rat Fucked, Why Your Vote Doesn't Count, and Unrigged, How Americans Battled Back to Save Democracy. He's the former editor-in-chief of Salon.com as well. He's got a recent piece in the New York Times that we discussed about redistricting and breaks it down. And it's been just awesome to talk with both Canberra Cruz and David Daly coming up. And I'm in a good mood here on a Friday. Well, frankly, it's still, seriously, it's, uh, if I'm being honest, still Thursday night. I've just wrapped up the hangout. There's like 40 people there. Went for about two hours with stand-up community members. And I got to tell you, if you've never come to one of those hangouts, you're missing out. If you're not a stand-up community member, you're missing out. What a great group of people. What an amazing, thoughtful, great group of people. We had a, a thoughtful and at times funny but serious argument about the ethics and the choice of letting your kids, in my case, uh, I, I'm using myself as an example, Ava, 16, going into New York City with a few of her friends, also 16, hang out for the day. And there were some folks who were like, I don't know about that. And other, other folks were like, and I've had this discussion a lot, but it was fun we all had got our points heard, and I was passionate, but really enjoying all of it. And so we did that, and everybody, it was great. We talked politics, we talked COVID, we talked about how my plumber came and snaked my drain, and I wanted him to snake something else because he was a real stud. I mean, this guy, I'm saying, listen, folks, I'm, I'm not gay, okay? I mean... I was yesterday for this guy. I mean, sometimes you just, a guy comes into your presence and I mean, the guy's like six foot three. He's got huge arms, all tatted up, both his arms, really handsome in the face. Uh, Ava called him a DILF, you know, because he was older, but he was huge and big and handsome. And he looked like, like a young Steven Seagal, maybe. Sorry, that didn't do any favors to him, did it? Anyway, he came by and he fixed the drain and then I just decided, well, I don't think this guy should leave. Spent some more time with this guy, and I had him basically check anything that had anything to do with, with water and drains and sinks and stuff. I was like, what do, what do you think about this one, huh, David? Real stud. And then we went for a hike for about three hours, and we watched the sunset together. And now he and I have uh, left our wives, and we're together. And we're all, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's weird, but also amazing. So <laughs> shout out to Dr. Roto, Dr. Reuter, rather. This guy's awesome. David Farrier, really helpful, came over, did the job, real smart guy and uh, enjoyed him. And yeah, sexy as hell. What can I tell you? Me and, me and uh, Ava <laughs> were like, hey guys, you're joking about how good looking he is. Anyway, we had a lot of fun uh, joking about that also on the hangout. I already did that bit once and then did, told the girls while well, Ava was there. And so, yeah, it was it was a lot of fun hanging out and I wish you could be there. And now I'm going to play the interview. So thank you very much for joining me. Amazing week here on the show. So many great guests, a bunch of first timers. Go back to the archives. 
anytime. Standupwithpete.com. Standupwithpete.com. Okay. Now, I already told you about Cambry Cruz a little bit and uh, David Daly a little bit. So I'm just going to uh, start with David Daly, who is the author of Rat Fucked and Unrigged, as I just said. We had a great conversation about where we're at in America right now with democracy, with redistricting, and why all of it matters so much, why these uh, voting rights bills that are stuck in Congress, it's, we, are, we have to pass them out of the Senate. Okay, David Daly is on Twitter, at DaveDaly3. I think you're going to really like this. He's super smart. Let's go. I think the craziness of this shirt needs to be dialed down. <laughs> I was going to ask you to throw on a coat. <laughs> well, I mean, I, got, I know there's a dress code. Yeah, the dress code is here at Santa Up Pete Dominic. It's, you know, it's semi-formal tops. Yeah, and no bottoms. I mean, I mean, I mean, who would know? Whatever you want. I usually like to think that people are wearing something crazy down there. Like, uh, like I have a metal kilt on. Uh, it's great to see you, and I'm happy. I'm, I'm psyched to talk to you. I've always got a billion questions for you, and I want to just ask you how you spent your uh, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp downtime. How did you? How did you internalize that? How did that hit you? Were you upset? You know, I didn't miss it at all, and it, it makes me feel like I could just unplug completely and just get rid of it. I mean, I could save democracy in the meantime and not be on Facebook and not waste that time. Um, I mean, it was a little bit depressing not to be able to stalk my ex-girlfriends from <laughs> uh, high school yeah. in, in yeah. quite the way that I, I expect to over the course of my work day. Yeah. I like to um, check in. I like to check in with exes daily to make sure that they had a worse day than me today. Like a, a day to day, Thing. It really helps me balance. It's super healthy. Yeah, I mean, I like to know what they're up to. It's it's kind of like <laughs> 1986, and um... <laughs> I, I felt that the I felt an energy of like my spidey sense was tingling like peace. Like it felt like uh, that. There's so much. There's a lot more bad on Facebook, especially in Instagram as well, than good. And it felt like oh, there's there's less bad being done right now. I wanted to call my racist uncle and tell him Facebook was fine for me right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't I don't know about you, but. Um... I mean, maybe they turned it off. Do you have a racist uncle? Um, I have one of those. I have, I have, I have some of those uh, family members and uncles that, um, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not just a comedy joke, right? These are oh. real people who sometimes we have to sit down with at ho on holidays, and and there's wine on holidays, and sometimes you say what's on your mind. Yeah. Have you have you have you broken things off? Have you changed anything major d drastically? It seems like we all have had to make strong choices yeah. about who we're going to spend time with, specifically and even if you want to say, you know what, this Thanksgiving and every Thanksgiving, let's not talk politics or religion. Let's stay away from those divisive subjects. Uh, but that no longer holds because now it's if you if you didn't get vaccinated, you guys can't come to Thanksgiving, right. which is which is kind of good. Right. I mean, that, <laughs> yeah, that makes the decision for us. Yes. Yeah, that's a good point. So I wanted to I always like to talk with you, given your your impressive career working in all types of different media outlets and having your work appear in all types of different media outlets. It would seem that we have gotten to a point where we're just reading a lot less. We're watching a lot more and what we do read. It's short bursts on, on social media and, and, and posts and we don't read as many full articles or, or, or books or, or newspaper articles. And we're really just getting so much from television and social media. And I just, I can't see that changing. Is that a fair assumption analysis? Do you think there's some nuance there? No, I think you're right. I think, I think our attention spans have been forever changed by Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and WhatsApp. And we, uh, it is, you know, you used to take the subway and see people, with a book, right? That used to be one of the fun things about taking the subway to work was seeing what everybody else was reading. And now everybody's just got their head buried in a phone. I mean, it was awesome when you couldn't get Wi-Fi on the subway. You at least had to have a magazine with you or a book or something. And now, you know, I mean, Jonathan Franzen's new book comes out today. Is anybody in New York going to be reading it? I will have no idea. I mean, it's Franzen <laughs> Day. I didn't realize it was Franzen Day. I stopped following him 
after bad things happen to uh, right to, yeah right um, you know <laughs> wow but there's there's so many wonderful books out right now too you know i mean um i'm i'm in i'm in the middle of uh the uh, new jordan ellenberg book on a geometry which is tremendous and the evan osnos book on 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 greenwich and and west virginia which is you know also fantastic and um i do have to go out and pick up the jonathan franzen today um you're gonna get which, it I, th I think i am i think i am i mean he had me he, he had me at suburban church and sad marriage <laughs> uh yeah you mentioned uh, just real quick, a lot of people heard you say that you're reading a book about geometry and got nauseous. Um, there's there's this terrific professor at the University of Wisconsin who writes about math in ways that can make it all make sense. And um, his name is Jordan Ellenberg, and he's got a book called called How to Be Wrong, I believe it's called. And then the new one, um, you're going to make me get up and grab it, um, which I can't do. But um look it, it is also terrific and there's a whole couple chapters on gerrymandering and the geometry of gerrymandering um which is what kind of interests me but he applies geometry to sort of all of these real life issues and it is it is super readable and not academic at all it's an absolute delight wow i'm looking at his website uh shape how not to be yes. wrong and the grasshopper king are his books huh Yes, uh, shape is 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 the new one, and it's fantastic. The hidden geometry of information, biology, strategy, democracy, and everything else. Oh, I'm glad we got all of those recommendations from you, David Daly. Of course, uh, your books are excellent as well, and you are the guy writing about redistricting and democracy in general, but specifically in terms of the way that elections are unfolding now because of a very specific issue, occurrence, strategy, and it's redistricting, it's gerrymandering, and I try to explain it, and I, you're always like in my head, in every conversation I have about politics, I'm always like, well, what about what David Daly's constantly talking about? I don't want you in my head I'm telling sorry. me these things, but you're there. And sometimes I ignore you. Sometimes I'll literally be in a conversation. I'm like, ah, forget. Shut up, Dave. Forget. Shut up, David. I'm not talking about the, the dis redistricting or gerrymandering. It affects everything. And that's the problem about gerrymandering is once you start looking at the world through the lens of how these districts are drawn and how it shapes and affects our elections, you can't stop. Uh, because it is the reason why you've got abortion bans coming out of Texas that are as brutal as they are. It's the reason why all of these states are able to do fraudulent audits. It's the reason why voter ID bills can pass. It's the reason why North Carolina can do transgender bathrooms. It's the reason why Michigan can do the emergency manager bill and have somebody flip the water supply in Flint, Michigan to the Flint River and kill kids and spark a Legionnaires crisis. It's why Ohio and all of these other states can get rid of mask mandates, even when their Republican governors want them. It's why Wisconsin under Scott Walker is able to gut collective bargaining and uh, teacher salaries. Redistricting is the heart of all of this. The public doesn't want any of those things. Republicans are only able to get them because they've They've gerrymandered districts in state legislatures around the country so that they are able to win with fewer votes. Well, you say, what, yeah. Yeah. you say the public doesn't want them, but what you mean more specifically is the vast majority of the people in a state don't want them. 10% or 20% or even right. maybe it's just a special interest that wanted them. Explain, take any, take a breath and take any one of those. I loved what you just said. That was such an important rant. I want to clip it out and share it. But take any one of those examples that you gave, and I know, sadly, you could have kept going, and tell me how it works. I know you've explained this a million times, but take a specific, you know, maybe Texas abortion, because it's the one that most people know about. How does gerrymandering affect that? What is the public uh, polling in Texas on that issue or any of the other ones that, that, that prove the point about what you're saying, that most people don't want this in a state or sometimes even in a district but the way that it is rigged, that's not how the outcomes turn out. The amazing thing about the public polling in Texas on the on the abortion bill um, is that 
not only are Democrats against it, independents are against it. 57% of Republicans are against it, and 52% of Trump voters are against it. This is not popular under any stretch of the imagination with the actual voters in Texas, except the, the state legislature in Texas doesn't care what the people want. They don't need to because they have gerrymandered themselves into such safe districts that they cannot lose. But th- but what just specifically what that means is because you, you laid it out perfectly. This thing, this is the most important point that people don't understand or hear because it's just such a, a, a fine point. Within that district, which is drawn like a crazy shaped jigsaw puzzle that makes no sense. Within that district, they do have approval of these things. Well, maybe. Uh, Right, maybe. But because the general election is so uncompetitive, no Democrat is actually going to run in that district or be able to raise any money to run in that district usually. Or because we're so polarized, people just aren't going to vote for the lib in, in Texas anyway. So the election itself doesn't really make that much of a difference. In Texas, Texas started out last decade at the beginning of this redistricting cycle, and the state house was 101 to 49. And the demographic change in Texas got it so close that it was down to nine seats by the end of the decade, nine seats that Republicans won by 11,000 votes. And they are able to do whatever they want because they fundamentally have been able to draw these lines. The lines have outrun the demographics. And right now we're in the middle of a new redistricting cycle in Texas. And what we are seeing is that Republicans are sandbagging up all of these lines for another decade. The population growth in Texas 95% of the population growth that earned them two additional seats in Congress is driven by minority voters, largely Latino voters and then Asian voters. Republicans have been able to draw state Senate and congressional districts that actually minimize the voting power of minority voters so that they have less power than they did even a decade ago. Okay, two just two things to clear up. So it's these they're, the districts are redrawn every decade. Every That's why you're years, uh, yes. right uh, after the census we do this. It's based on the census numbers, which is why we heard so much controversy uh, about during the Trump administration when they were taken. Uh, just another terrible consequence of timing that that ten years came up during his administration where he had the power to to do it, and they 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 tried very hard to do something. The Supreme Court didn't let them do. But when you say the lines have outrun the demographics, and I think you kind of explained it, yeah. but more specifically, could you give me a, an occasion where that's the case and what that means? Sure. What we know is that the demographics of this country are changing. We are becoming a multiracial nation. I know. The I watched Tucker census, Carlson. I'm, that's all I know. Yeah. The, la- <laughs> the last census confirmed it, and you know, certainly Tucker is afraid of it every single night. But we have not become a multiracial democracy, right? And there are many reasons for that throughout our history. But one of the big reasons why we have not become a multiracial democracy recently has to do with redistricting. When you draw these districts, what you are able to do when you have the power of the pen or or these days the supercomputer and the map making software is if you're a Republican, what your goal is, is to pack as many of the other side's voters into as few seats as possible. So what they do is they pack Democratic voters, and um, especially Black voters and Latino voters, into districts that they win overwhelmingly, 85 90% of the vote. And then that bleaches all of the surrounding districts, whiter, older, rural, more conservative, and bleaches. they're able to hold on and win there. Very well explained. And your new article at the New York Times, published last week, voters had their say, partisans ignored them. Boy, did I hate this article. Sorry. Uh, You break it down by state about what's going on. You write in recent weeks, efforts in Arizona, Ohio, Michigan and Virginia have been a cruel awakening for those who had hoped commissions might bring balance. And you break it down state by state. Everybody's got to read this. Looks like it's been a pretty uh, popular article. Really important stuff that you're always writing about. 
So what do we need to know uh, here in our conversation? People should read the article about what's happened in, in recent weeks and what that means in a few weeks on Election Day. We knew that redistricting was going to be really bad this year in Texas and Georgia and Florida and North Carolina. We knew that Republicans were going to go all out in those states and and rewire maybe a dozen congressional seats in their direction. Just to be clear, well really bad, really bad for Democrats, really good for Republicans when you say really bad. I would say really bad for voters. Um, but, you <laughs> know, okay? I mean, um, good, good. Well done. Yes. But certainly bad for Democrats. Um, but we knew that those states were going to be, you know, a bacchanalia of, of, of partisan gerrymandering. Republican map makers and togas going, you know, pack and crack. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and what has happened is that voters stood up over the course of the last several years and they demanded change in many states in red states and blue states and purple states. They tried to create additional guardrails on the redistricting process to keep partisans from hijacking it, or they tried to force these lines into the hands of independent commissions. And what we have seen is that Republican operatives in these states they're like zombies and stranger things, you know? I mean, if you lock the front door, they come in through the window. Right, And right. you can't keep them out. Like in Michigan, for example. Um, voters in Michigan voted 61% to turn this over to a, to, to a nonpartisan commission of citizens to draw lines. And so the most partisan, one of the most partisan and evil Republican law firms in the country, the law firm that helped gerrymander Ohio and defended the gerrymanders in North Carolina and Pennsylvania, became the litigation counsel for this commission, right? If they couldn't walk in through the front door, they found a way to climb in through the windows. Wow. In Ohio, where more than 70% of voters demanded a constitutional amendment that said you cannot draw lines that favor or disfavor any political party and insisted that the maps um, match up to the political breakdown of the state, which is about 54-46 Republican. Republicans drew themselves a map that gives them super majorities in both chambers. And they said, well, yes, maybe the state is 54 46 but there's another way of looking at political breakdown which is we've won 13 of the 16 statewide races so we are actually entitled to 81 percent and by making it just 65 or 70 percent in the state house we're actually compromising right i mean it, so like by that standard republicans could be shut out of the state legislature in new york or california because they've never won a statewide race there it's it's absolutely insane math. In Arizona, this commission has just been absolutely hijacked by Republicans. It's, a, it's been a seven-year effort to hijack the independent commission, uh, stack it with partisans, uh, set it up with an executive director who uh, worked for Republicans and, and hid the $63,000 that he made from uh, Martha McSally's campaign and did not include it on his resume and then hire oh, a conservative God. map maker who's really good at cracking and packing Latino voters. And all of this is going to add up. I mean, Democrats have got a five seat advantage in the U.S. House. It's only five seats. They could lose more than a dozen through redistricting alone. And that could be the majority. So that's why this is so important. You know, it's it, it's important because of all the all of the policy implications. It's important because of what's happening in state legislatures. But it's also important because, I mean, Democrats won the national popular vote for the U.S. House, which I know isn't a thing, but, but stick with me. They won it by 4.7 million votes in 2020. You could run the 2022 election. You know, So if you ran the 2020 election again under the 2022 maps, you would have a Republican House, even though 4.7 million more people voted for Democratic candidates. Because of the way the districts are drawn and because of the yeah. deletion of several of these seats. If you if you move these lines around, you could see, um, I mean, North Carolina right now elects eight Republicans and five Democrats. 
they picked up one more seat. So that's going to be a 14 seat delegation. Republicans could draw an 11 3 map there. So there's three seats that they could grab for themselves. It was a 10 3 map under the, uh, under the last Republican gerrymander. They're going to grab probably at least two more in Florida. Uh, there's at least one more in Georgia, one in Texas. Um, so when you do this, it changes the math, right? You pack the Democrats into districts that they're already winning. So, so like in Georgia, for example, the 6th and the 7th district are, are the seats around Atlanta. A, a, a Democrats right now have both of those seats. They, they narrowly took one of them because the, uh, the suburbs of Atlanta have been, have been changing, becoming more Democratic. What Republicans did is they redrew the 7th district, which had been about uh, a six-point Democratic uh, a district, and it is now an 18-point Trump district. That's what happens when you move a couple wow. of these lines. That's you slide a really good more ex- Democrats into the sixth, and you surrender that one, and that one goes from being reasonably close to overwhelmingly a blue, but then you, you give yourself a couple of others. That is a really, really good specific example. I feel like the the issue here is that Republicans, the machine, the established, whatever you want to call it, activists, conservatives, whatever, around the country – they are always so much more organized and well-funded. And that's specifically because of, if I don't use labels, there's a certain group of Americans, but we see government differently. We see the idea of government differently. And, and some people think government, it, it should be there as an operating body so that we can have functioning, healthy society. And then other people, and I've learned this certainly entering local politics, over the past couple of years, look at government like a bank account. How do we get all of the money that's going in there out to us? And so how that breaks down is they get seats in government and then they funnel the, the taxpayer money, the contracts to themselves and their friends. And it doesn't get proportioned equally and it doesn't work for most of us. It's not democratic, really. But there's so much more interest in doing that. So there's so much more interest. There's so much more to be gained, people might say. Uh, by taking those seats, redone drawing these districts, getting control of all the money, then there is for people who think of government differently, progressives and Democrats, who are seemingly almost always reacting to what Republicans have been planning and rigging for years, including like I think Stacey Abrams' whole movement was a reaction to what happened in Georgia when that election, when she lost that election to some extent. Obviously, there was a movement before that, but it was a reaction to the Voting Rights Act being gutted. It's always us reacting and trying to keep up with these, you know, moneyed interests, individuals and groups, it's not a conspiracy. It's obvious what they're doing. They see government as a bank account. How did I do explaining that? Because I want to know how we change this. They're always on offense, right? They're always on offense and they're always just, you know, it's like you're on offense against a team that's just, you know, making up the rules as they go along yeah, yeah, and running yeah. off the guardrails. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, how do you defend against this? Yeah. Uh, and then you end up trying to defend against what they did last time, and then they're on to something else. Right. So it is, it, is, it, is, it is really challenging. And the other challenge is once you've been gerrymandered, it is really hard to win on a gerrymandered map. So you're at this sort of permanent disadvantage as you're trying to claw back, and then they pass voter ID laws, and then they make it harder for your side to vote, and it all compounds upon itself. So when I hear the Biden White House talking about how, oh, we'll just out-register them and out-turn out them, you can't out-register and out-vote a gerrymander. That is the idea of it. It is set up in such a way as to stay ahead of you. But I think so much of what we're talking about here comes back to the fact that Republicans are more desperate to do this because they know they don't have 50% of the people plus one on their side. They recognize the nature of the changing demographics of the country. Right. They see what the future is. And this is what they have to do to hold on yes, to power yes, yes, and to yes. hold on to the contracts and to hold on to everything that comes with power. And if they don't, they will lose. And so desperation has turned them into a party that is willing to do all of these tricks and all of these rule riggings and manipulations to try to stay there. Yeah, that's a far better and more succinct theory as to what their motivation is than 
the the one I gave, which is about money. And it's not to say, by the way, that Democrats don't do that as well. Try to oh, Democrats love contracts. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I was blaming it but, on Republicans. But but yeah. the idea of, of democracy and of, of government in the most pure way is that there that it's there to you. Sh- I'm certain that you have a much more erudite way of articulating government's purpose and function. But I think it's there to for the public's interest to create more equitable, healthy societies and to make sure that if your kids that there's a school and there's teachers in that school and that's safe. And then if your kids want to come to that school, government's job is to make sure that you get all your vaccinations like it's there to make sure you're healthier in that case. I absolutely agree. Um, And the piece that I would add is that a majority of citizens ought to be able to change their government if they feel that it is not working for them. And that is what Republicans have found a way to put an end to. They have found a way to put an end effectively to the consent of the governed. I mean, if you live in Wisconsin or North Carolina, you are effectively not living in a democracy. A majority of you cannot change the nature of your government. We already have this country in which the presidency is not determined by the popular vote. It's determined by an electoral college that favors small, rural, whiter states. We have a U.S. Senate that has the exact same uh, bias that by 2035, 70% of the population is going to live in 15 states and have 30 senators. And those small states are going to dominate that entire body. We have... A Supreme Court, five of the six conservative justices have been picked by presidents that have lost the national popular vote and been confirmed by that U.S. Senate. You know, a U.S. Senate that that right now is 50-50, but the Democrats represent 41.7 million more people. Unbelievable. And now when you add into that the effect of gerrymandering and redistricting in state legislatures in the U.S. House, it compounds this crisis of Republican minority rule that we are dangerously close to checkmate. And um, if you think it can't happen here, just ask the uh, citizens of Wisconsin and North Carolina what the last decade has been like there. Yeah, if anybody is politically uh, informed in either of those states, they'll bend your ear for as long as you need to warn you about what could happen in your state. All right, I'll let you go, but how do you want to do, do you want to game this out at all about what you see happening in the next year, the different way, I mean, obviously it can go a whole bunch of different ways, but is there a likely path that you think will take? Democrats have the ability to put an end to so much of this right now. There's a couple of terrific bills in front of, of Congress. You've got the Freedom to Vote Act, which is the Mansion Compromise, the substitute of the, of the For the People Act, and you've got the a reintroduced John Lewis Voting Rights Act reauthorization that is being reintroduced this week. Democrats have got to pass these two laws. They've got included in the in the Freedom to Vote Act a ban on partisan gerrymandering that could reopen the federal courts to these claims once again. And the Voting Rights Act reauthorization would shore up uh, Section 2, which came under assault in the Brnovich decision back in June, and also a restore preclearance that was gutted in the Shelby County versus Holder case back yep. in 2013. We might not get this chance again, is what I'm saying, you know? Do we have the votes? Do Democrats have the votes to pass both those or well, not? Well, Democrats have the majority, so uh, they could pass these bills if they wanted. No, but they uh, don't have mansion. Do they have mansion and cinema on both those voting bills? Uh, Cinema was a co-sponsor of the original For the People Act, and the Freedom to Vote Act is uh, the Mansion Compromise. So they should. They should be able to pass them if they— So the trouble here becomes the filibuster on that bill. Will Democrats be willing to break the filibuster to save democracy? If they do not, the chance of them having the House at any point in time over the next decade, I would say, is a real long shot. You never say never, but the way these lines are going to be drawn, it's going to be extraordinarily difficult. This is the chance to do it, and they've got to use this power while they have it. All right. Well, you have to leave me on something positive. They uh, have the power, and they can do it. On on something positive, uh, remotely uh, apolitical, nothing, has nothing to do with anything. A joy in your life, David, uh, whether it be a meal or something that's happened with your children or your or your summer, or how you feel about autumn, hurry, say something. 
uh, apple picking, uh, yes. apple picking, apple cider donuts. I live in the apple cider donut capital of America. And pretty much if I've gained a few pounds since yes. the last time I have seen you, it is because <laughs> I'm going from orchard to orchard yes. sampling apple cider donuts. And it is the best. There's a guy who's got a, a Twitter or Instagram where he's visiting like all the orchards in Massachusetts, I think. Just that's. that's- and my, my he main has stolen he has stolen my job. I know that I is was my like, dream job. I was, and I'm going to find him and get him. Yeah, I was like, how is that a, a an affordable lifestyle? How do I find out how to do that myself? I would I would like that Instagram account. That's awesome. Thank you so much for talking to me. I always appreciate it. And oh, I will talk to you soon, I hope, sir. Thank you for having me. Bye bye. All right, Dave Daly. David Daly. Dave Daly three on Twitter. Get his books. Read him at the New York Times. Let him know you heard him here on Stand Up. I, like I said, I, he's really impresses me with his knowledge base, his ability to reference it in a conversation like this. I think he's great on the podcast. So I love talking to him anytime he has writing something or wants to weigh in. He has got a place here on Stand Up. Open door policy, sir. Okay. Next, I've got Christian Finnegan off this week. So we got his wife. And we are definitely not settling because his wife is just an amazing human being. And now she's running for office in Keshecton, New York. You can go to CambryCruise.com to learn more and to donate. There's a link in today's show notes as well. But she's just an amazing person. We talked, uh, go back and listen to the first interview with her. You can just look it up in the archives. And people love that. She wrote an amazing memoir a few years ago called Burn Down the Ground. It was adapted into a a lifetime documentary, and she grew up with parents who were deaf. At one point, she lived in a tin shed with no electric plumbing or running water. She has overcome breast cancer. She's a successful business person. She saved live performance in New York in a huge way and she owns her own business in New York and she's now running for office because she and Christian have an apartment in New York City but they also have a a small place where she's registered to vote because they spent a lot of time in upstate New York in Keshecton, New York and so she's running for town council we talked about all of it I think it's a great conversation I'm really happy to end the week on it Cambria Cruz for town council Okay, I just told you all about her, and now she is joining me again. And to be honest, I'd have her a lot more if it weren't weird that her husband is Christian Finnegan. Oh, like he's he's stealing my airtime. I mean, kind of like, well, he's not stealing your airtime, but it's like I'd like to talk. I love talking to you, but you are a good friend of mine's wife, and like I don't want to force this friendship with you. You know how it is. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, even though I knew you before I, uh, you knew, well, no, maybe not. I, I definitely knew you in the comics days. I have pictures of us hanging out backstage at comics. For sure. I mean, I'm, I'm, I must've met, no, but I knew Christian before comics and I did meet you there. And so my loyalty lies with you (laughs) actually with you, the more I'm thinking about it, it lies with you. So I'm happy (laughs) to have you joining me and I'm excited that you are running for town council, which we are going to, to talk about, but I do want to just start by, in case people never heard the first episode, but they should go back and listen because we got really deep into your childhood and the loss of your father and and some really important issues surrounding prison reform, incarceration reform. But I just want to know, like, how your last year has been to lead us into this conversation about you running for town council. One of your qualifications, of course, is that you're a business owner and you led a pretty important kind of political campaign for small businesses. Tell us a little about your awesome business and how you saved it and along with a whole bunch of others in New York. Yeah, I I own QED, which is a performance art space slash it's a comedy club, but I I hate the just uh pigeonholing it into the idea of what people have at this comedy club because we do so many other things there, meetups and movie screenings and storytelling. It's this really versatile versatile uh community space that really is full of so much good vibes that it, it's really a special little place. I love the, I'm, I come for the store. Yeah, like the, well, that's new. And that's a pivot during the pandemic. I love being, so the the front end of it mm-hmm. is like books and games and 
like stuff for your brain, all good stuff, your brain and your soul. I loved being in the space and being surrounded by all that stuff. It had a positive vibe, all those books and things. Yeah. And a lot of people complimented me on, on the uh, inventory. And I was like, Oh, it's, it's all stuff that I want. Uh, I, right. And so I get to have all this stuff without it being in my apartment. So <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, I love, I love all this stuff. Um, so yeah, I'm glad you like it, but that is definitely a direct uh, result of having to shut down during the pandemic. And, to you mean to like adapting uh, yeah. and, and to right and then so so we can talk about adapting and we can talk about surviving. I mean, basically, how did you survive and how did you help these other businesses as well? Well, I survived because there was a rent moratorium. I mean, really, that's it. Period. Full stop. I, the, if if there had not been a rent moratorium, um, we definitely would not have survived. I, my landlord is a great landlord, but to go 13, 14 months with not being able to be open in the normal capacity in, in its normal state was pretty devastating. And having lost my dad in the way that I lost my dad during this whole pandemic with him being in prison, having been paroled, them refusing to release him even though he'd been paroled and it's in the height of a pandemic, I mean, let him out, whatever. That That was so enraging and soul crushing. And it's very, very frustrating to be in a position of zero power. You are absolutely beholden to, to all these other people to make these decisions for you. Right. And then separately, my company, exact same situation. I'm closed and Cuomo holds all the power on what is allowed to reopen. And he, for some unknown reason, was allowing outdoor events for people, 50 or fewer people, but you couldn't charge tickets. If you charged a ticket, that became this official event and you weren't allowed to do it. Uh, it's a little more complicated than that, but that's at the end of the day, that's it in a nutshell. So Bryant Park was having bingo and dancing and uh, dance lessons and stuff, all kinds of great fun things outdoors. If I wanted to do that exact same event at my licensed venue and charge a ticket, I was not allowed to. And that was maddening, enraging, soul crushing. So having these two things parallel to each other, my father and, and the, the pandemic with my theater, I, I felt so helpless. And when I feel that way, I get very angry and also um, very motivated to do something about it. Right, and right. I, it's very important for me to be able to control my destiny, I guess. Um, I don't know if this is having had uh, being a child of deaf adults and always being in charge of things for the family. I don't uh, know if this is all like, you know, lizard brain deep rooted or it's just my personality. I don't know, whatever nature versus nurture, but I wasn't going to stand back and not do anything. So I organized all the comedy clubs. I became very active in the National Independent Venues Association's New York chapter and the membership director, I guess, uh, of that. And we lobbied hard for Chuck Schumer to include us in the Save Our Stages, which is now known as the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant. And Chuck Schumer, I got to say, is an amazing advocate for the arts. I am so impressed by him and what he was able to accomplish for us. And he was uh, very in touch with us, too. It wasn't like him doing press and photo ops, which, yeah. you know, politicians get a lot of flack for that. He was on the phone. He was having Zooms with us. I the, When they passed, the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant was included in the bill that Trump ended up signing in December 2019. Before it hit the news, I got a call from Schumer's office. Uh, and I was standing on my bar doing the chalkboard. And when the call came in and they were like, we did it, we got it, we got it in there. You're, you're going to get the relief you need. So that was one thing. And then separately, I uh, was lobbying Cuomo to allow us to reopen safely. And I wrote a five page plan on safely reopening outdoor events, which was approved by the State Liquor Authority and the New York Department of Health and all of the 
rungs along the ladder that lead up to Cuomo, but Cuomo would not sign it. And now in retrospect, I realize, oh, I think this was a personal thing with him and Senator Generis, who was my um, advocate with this. Uh, Senator Generis is known as the Amazon killer because he right. killed the Amazon deal. Right. deal. And he's yeah. your state senator in New York. And so there's <clears throat> there's bad blood there. And Cuomo yeah. is the king of personal vendetta and grudges. That's how he operated. So. Oh, and I, I, I knew it talking with his office. You could feel it. It was definitely in the air. And when I had very frank conversations with Senator Generis and a lot of city leaders and Everyone all agreed this is it's Cuomo. There's nothing you can yeah. do about well, it. He's the one. I, just a quick follow up on that in terms of, you know, you I'm not that surprised that that Chuck Schumer or any state senator, New York state representative. Would be an advocate for the arts because the arts in New York are a special interest like entertainment, theater, all of it. They donate to campaigns and they have a lot of power so that that that's not that surprising, but still great. Awesome. You you said lobbied twice, lobbied Schumer and lobbied your state senator. And I think it's really important because when we think of lobbying lobbyists, I think we we, we have an, it's a, we think bad. We think the tobacco industry, the, the fossil fuel industry, whatever. Anybody can be a lobbyist. But I think it's important that people understand what you accomplished almost, <clears throat> you know, without any help. Obviously, you organized people and that's how you got things done. But you started this when you say lobbying. Wh- what does that mean? Writing letters, calling Advocating, yes, writing letters, calling, organizing, making it easy for other people to help you. Yeah. So they, I, I want, I want to advocate for you, Pete. But I don't. What do you want me to say? Who do I need to call? Getting that information in front of of people to be like, here's how it's easy. Click here if you want to donate money. Click here if you can make a phone call. Click here to find out who to call, what to say, that kind of thing. In fact, I'm doing that right now for my my little podunk uh, race that I'm running in. Um, some people wanted to volunteer to write postcards for me. So, you know, here here's 25 addresses and names. Here's what you should write. This is what it looks like. Here's a sample of my handwriting. If you want to try to make it look like mine, or you can write it in your own voice, you know, I'm giving them options, whatever they're comfortable with, but that's something that they can do on my behalf and make it as easy as possible. People want to help, but we're all busy, you know? Yeah, well, no, we're all busy and we all don't have a lot of money and we all have to work. I think that's one of the most interesting things I learned in my exploration to run for my local town council was that who was engaged, who was interested. It was generally the people that had the time and resources to be, which often means older folks. So you got these really motivated people, maybe in their late 20s, uh, well, any age. Right. But certainly I'm I'm thinking where I live and, and maybe where you, you know, 40s and 30s and 40s. And it's like they're in the peak of their career. Their kids are little. They're not thinking about these things. They're working their asses off. And yet they'd be really effective at advocates if you could get them engaged. But it's hard to get those those folks yeah. engaged. So let's but let's talk about that's why we all need to be even in, at that age. Let's talk about specifically, you know, well, you got you got that done in New York, which is a huge accomplishment. You got an award for that. Didn't you get like recognized yeah. for that? Yeah, the state legislature gave me a, a COVID Heroes Award or something like that. COVID yeah, and, um, Heroes. Time Time Out New York named me one of their Women of the Year. Yeah, which honestly, that was the coolest because um, it's you know it was New York City centric, even though a lot of the work that I did was for the state for statewide venues and and even on a federal level too in in, a, in some ways. Um, but I told my mom I was like. I was one of eight women in New York and there's 8 million people in New York. So, Hey, I'm one in a million. Ah, that's great. I love it. Well, congratulations. You deserve that credit. You, you know, you are someone that has a a, a tremendous uh, uh, resilience and response to, you know, challenging times. I don't want to be resilient anymore. Jesus, let me just, please let me coast. (laughs) You know, (laughs) well, yeah, but it's the the flip side of that is not having a great sense of resilience, which is something I've been talking about openly that I don't feel that I'm really good at, at 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 least adapting immediately to a bunch of bad things at once. I can usually handle one, maybe two, but like recently I had like kind of three things happening in all sectors of my life. And I was like, I'm going to nap now. I'm going <laughs> to take a nap. And when I wake up, it'll go away. You, right. and I mean, I think I eventually maybe get to your, the point that, that you kind of, 
get to in terms of being motivated, but you, you really do work really hard and pivot. And while it would be nice for you to be able to relax and coast, I think you're always going to be a person who's probably going to uh, move on to new things and, and, and challenges, which is what you're doing now after all that advocacy and using the tools and resources to organize folks to save our stages. You now want to also make a difference in Cachectin? Am I saying it right? No, no. Cachectin. That's what I said. I don't, I think I nailed it. Cachectin. <laughs> Cachectin, New York. It's a small town north of New York City. And you and Christian have a little place there, a very little place, uh, yeah, a little, little spread. One bedroom, and, which honestly, for us, we don't have kids. And this is bigger than any apartment we've ever had. <laughs> Right. You have dogs and you guys uh, leave the city and you spend a good amount of time there. You spend a good amount of time during the pandemic there. So why are you running for town council in Keshecton, New York? Well, uh, Christian always says that I like a new mountain to climb. And so he's not surprised whenever I want to like mm. strike out on some completely new venture if, where I'm at the bottom of the mountain, you know, and I'm, I've, I see the peak and I've, I've got to get up there. And uh, he's totally right. I, I've done this multiple times in my life. I've completely gutted my career and started from absolute scratch. I was a vice president of a bank making over six figures when I was 27 years old, and I quit. I just walked away from it and became an actor slash promoter slash legal assistant in New York. You know, I, like I, for whatever reason, I like to just burn down the ground and try again, as we like to say, and that's the title of my book, plug, plug. <laughs> Um, but I do like a new mountain to climb, but the, going back to the, those two parallel problems I was having with my dad and, and the pandemic and Cuomo and all that stuff, it was maddening to not have a voice in the room to make decisions and to be beholden to other people, to understand my message, communicate that message well enough to the person in charge. It's like, well, how do I get to be the person in charge then? Because this is bullshit. I can't not have some say in this. And so to be a town council, I'm not going to be the one in charge, but at least I'll be in the room to steal from Hamilton. You know, I want to be in the room where it happens. I think it's important to have a voice in some of that. Um, you got to start somewhere. And so I'm starting at the bottom of this mountain. And it's like, well, think globally, act locally. Well, as local as it gets, Kashecton, where my house is. And so I'm, that's where I'm starting. That's really exciting. I think, you know, having you in the room and having you, in, I mean, you're the kind of person who sees, uh, you just explain it well with that metaphor about a mountain, but you, you know, you remind me of my wife in that. What's the problem? Let me go solve it. Let me add it. Let me have, I'm going to go knock it down and get organized and learn whatever it takes to overcome this to make this happen as you just explained you've done that so many times for yourself and your life as well as your business and your community and so now you're in Keshecton and doing this so what are the like what are the issues there when I ran for a town council here it was really interesting to hear about the things that people were concerned with which were not a lot of the issues that we hear about at the national level but one thing certainly is always like development where can we build? And I think the issue there becomes, well, who's making money off of this? And what do the people that live here want built, need built? You know, how many people do we want here paying taxes? Those kinds of things seem to be always animating local town councils. And so, you know, what are the issues besides that, which I, I think is probably one of them? Well, the development has not been a hot button issue so much in Coshecton. In Sullivan County, it absolutely is, mm -hmm. the county as a whole. There's a lack of uh, housing here. So they're talking about even before the pandemic, there was a, a problem with trying to find employees. It, you can't get people to work up here because there's no place for them to live and driving and gas and all that. When you start to add up all the costs, it's not like, why would you work around here? There's other neighboring communities where you, you could. Well, yeah, no, it's a really, yeah. It's like, yeah, no, I definitely want to work at your restaurant or at your, your little firm, but where do I, when I'm done working, where do I go? Do right. I, is there a place that you have? Cause I can't afford to live here and there's nothing here, even if I no. could. 
there's giant farms and big houses and um, the Airbnb issue, you know, has taken away a lot of affordable rentals and stuff. Um, again, this isn't so much a Cushecton issue as it is a Sullivan County issue. Right now, the hot button issue, I wouldn't even say hot button. It's a very sleepy little issue right now, which is they're going to opt out of selling cannabis, which is I'm agog at why they would opt out of it. And it's unfortunately going to be decided before the election. So, or, or maybe even after the election, but I won't oh. take office until January if I should win. So the decision ha will have already been made by the time I take office. Yeah. So but, New York state legalized recreational cannabis and I'm not even following, even though I should be, uh, because I got my own, <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, when it's all supposed to take effect and when stores are supposed to open, but you don't know why they opted out. I mean, what are the, so they, are, they haven't quite opted out yet. There's a hearing coming up on November 10th or a public meeting. Bring so much but money. It, I mean, it, it's mind boggling. Okay. Cause Shecton is actually on the Delaware river, Pennsylvania. You can throw a stick at it and everybody from New York, drives over to Pennsylvania and buys fireworks because fireworks are illegal in New York. So what do you think is going to happen when you legalize pot in New York? All that money we're spending on fireworks is going to come right back here. They're going to all want to buy their pot here in New York. It's being on a border town. It's no, a no brainer that you would want to uh, opt in for that sales tax alone. What they're worried about is the on-site consumption which no one wants around here. This is not a town where anybody wants to have an on-site consumption type place. It, there, no. Um, Wait, but, uh, like a venue, like a cigar. Like, I don't even know what that is, where you go and you smoke pot. In Amsterdam, a coffee shop in Amsterdam. Why would anybody care about that? They have bars. I Yes, I know. Right. Yes, you're right. No one stumbles out of a, a pot cafe they they might slowly walk out well and <laughs> that like is the other fighting. issue is like well how do you test for impairment there's a drug test or there's an alcohol breathalyzer so that's what people are concerned about illegal not uh, drugging and driving kind of thing right which that okay let's take on-site consumption off the table then this town isn't even of uh, the type of place where I, I, as a pot smoker, would not want to go to Koshekton's coffee shop. To <laughs> right. lounge. You know, you are going to like New York City or Amsterdam or what? I don't. I know. don't know. You you would be the person to open that shop because you know exactly what you're doing. Uh, uh, yeah, I know. I was like, huh? Women and minorities get uh, uh, an affordable license, do they? Let me see about getting. A oh, license. is that right? In New York State, women and minorities are are incentivized to get into the cannabis selling business. Yeah by giving them yes oh because that's they're historically underrepresented as business owners and uh in access to money and that sort of thing and they want to make sure it's equitable which is awesome terrific. i disagree right. i think it was fine the way it was and <laughs> i'm not sure how i want to take my country back so it's white men who will have the the, the first oh, shot at such a whole bunch of guys I can introduce you to. They were uh, they they all got together at uh, there was some little thing dust up at on January sixth. You might be familiar. Yeah, with those uh, those guys seem to be yeah. on the same board. They want the the anyway. Um, They're all around here. I can put you in touch. So, what are some of the other issues in in that in that town? Oh well, wait. Back to the cannabis, real quick. Yeah. About it. At the town meeting, one of the council members that I'm not running up against. He's not up for a couple of years. He said, but yeah. Oh, so take, take on-site consumption off the table. We're talking about, we would like to just have dispensaries because a dispensary is nothing more than, like you said, a liquor store. There's liquor stores everywhere. A dispensary, you can zone where they're allowed and how many in your community that there are allowed, right? Uh, the one liquor store right on the Delaware River, the owner of that seems like he might be interested in having a dispensary. So he's very frustrated that they're going to opt out of this because I think he had a, a business plan and model mm. set up in his mind, right? Um, so take that off the table, the dispensary only. One of the council members like, oh, but we have a high school. There's a high school in town. And I was like, dude. Currently, your high school is the dispensary, first of all. <laughs> and B, there's a liquor store and a bar at the bottom of the driveway. So you're not worried about the children 
in the high school. This is some weird, prudish, it's so bizarre. My mom's 74. And when she comes up here, I'm like, where am I going to find my mom some weed? She wants to, I don't, I don't even really smoke. So I'm like, I got to hook my mom up for her weed. Well, if your mom, if your mom's into fireworks, that shouldn't be too hard. You could just, that's, uh, there's no strip clubs in that town. Not in Coshecton. There are in Sullivan oh. County. Yes. Okay. Cause that would be a, you know, that would be like, really? That's what about that? I mean, if we yeah. want to. And, um, yeah. So yeah, the other issues back to that, um, there, I would love a dog park. Frankly, I met a guy who I was out putting out a lawn sign at this intersection and he stopped his car and he goes, is that you? And I was like, what? And he's like, on the poster, is that you? And I said, yeah, it's me. And he said, all right, what ticket are you running on? And I said, Democrat. And he goes, no, um, you know, like all the wind got knocked out of him. And I was like, oh, but all these hyper local issues, Republican and Democrat don't really matter. I want a dog park. And he goes, oh, yeah, dog park. That'd oh, be nice. That's really smart. Yeah, that's the answer is, you know, to, to what ticket are you running on? It's I'm running on the cannabis shop, dog park and list the issues. And then if he still wants to follow up, be like, no, but what party? But like, well, what do you think of those? Like, really? Pre and then what? Well, OK, so Democratic Party, but, you know, but like you leave it for last because that's people all most of these things aren't that controversial. Most people are, are probably for them, which is why you're running right. and they hear that one word, liberal, conservative, Democrat. And it's like, whoa, hey, what do we yeah. agree and disagree on? Yeah, especially now it's very hyper uh, polarized. And um, so I did. I, I said when it's hyper local, you know, I want a dog park. But then I also um, then I, I somehow I, Somehow, I'm so charming, Pete. I somehow got him to stay on the side of the road for a few minutes and cars were like driving around and one guy started honking at him. But he just kept wanting to talk with me because uh, we were. I just kept saying things that drew him in, which is like preservation is not another important thing. And he said something about, well, you want to preserve, right? And I said, well, look, my family, I trace my family back to the 1600s here in this area. And he was like, what? Really? Whoa. Cause they also hear that I'm from the city and that I'm not from New York. You know, I'm from Texas and I have a business in the city. So that also makes me other, you know, right. You're a carpet bagger. Right. But even though I've been up here for 10 years and I've been registered to vote up here for, I think five or six, but, um, and you know, when I had cancer back in 20, what, 15, 16, something like that. Um, I, that's when I really started living up here almost, almost full time. It's like four days up here, three days in the city. Um, and, or even more up here. Cause I can run my business remotely for the most part. God, but, I just am thinking of the ad right now for you, where it's just you walking down the street, listing all of the shit you've beaten, you've overcome your childhood, the issues with your dad, cancer, the hurricane, the pandemic. And then it ends with you going, I think I can get a dog park done. Yeah, right. I think if I can't get a dog park, <laughs> something's really wrong. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's like you've done so much. You've overcome so many challenges. You have so many accomplishments. And like you said, you've lived so many lives at, at a young age and you've seen so much of life. It's like, I think I think you can figure out town council. And then, you know, more importantly, you have so much energy and intelligence that you just don't see in the local sector, you see some old fogey that's been around forever that doesn't know how to work their iPhone in a time where you really know how to, you need to know how to get things done, which means you know how to open your iPhone. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, trying, that's hopefully what I'll get and press upon them. We have a meet and greet on the 12th is like, listen, I didn't know how to open a comedy club. I opened a comedy club. I didn't know how to do X, Y, Z. I, I, you know, I, got a bill passed. I helped write a, a bill with Senator Generis to help protect small business owners during the pandemic. And it passed the state Senate, uh, just, just this le last legislative session. I didn't know how to write a bill before. I didn't know how to write a path to reopening that the governor would accept. And I did that, you know, they, they since, by the way, they ha have since used a lot of the uh, plan that I wrote on safely reopening outdoor spaces. So, um, yeah, it's like uh, I, I, me not being from here isn't, I don't think it is a, a detriment. It means that I have a wider net of 
networks yeah. uh, of resources and um, people who can help. So, yeah, you know, uh, a, a whole lot of people uh, and a whole lot of places. So, so let me just ask you about the money. You know, that's that's the thing that I came up against that anybody running for even town council, which is what you're running for, which is what I was thinking about and may in a couple of years run for. And do you have any idea how much money you need and what do you need that money for? Because that's the the toughest, most challenging part is raising the money, asking for money. But it's really to promote your campaign. It's really for signs and advertisements. I like advertisements as the pronunciation. Yes. Just in that one word, not on the rest. I think they're sociopaths, but advertisements I do. So what do you need? You know, what do you need the money for? How are you raising money? CambryCruise.com. If you want to go and donate, you can also find her on Twitter at Cambry. Cambry Cruise, C-R-E-W-S.com. I should say the whole name. On Twitter at, and on Facebook, I'm just Cambry. I'm the. I was for many, many years the only Cambry, but I know a lot of kids have been named after me in Texas, and you know it's kind of like that old Vidal Sassoon commercial. And they tell two friends, and they tell two friends. So now there's a whole lot of Cambries in and, Texas region. Uh, and, and it's original name, yeah, you got it uh, on on Twitter at Cambry. And and for the creeps out there. You know, I think it doesn't hurt. Let's be honest. It doesn't. I mean, it does hurt in some ways, I suppose, to hold you back. But it doesn't hurt that you've, uh, you're, you've got a beautiful face. So, like, yeah. your, your picture on the – on your you're like a beautiful woman, and you've got, like, this amazing hair and stuff. So, like, for the creeps, go go to CambryCruise.com just to see her and then <laughs> donate. But, like, it doesn't hurt that you look the way you look to get people to listen to what you have to say, I bet. I'm just being petty, but like- – my picture on the uh, lawn signs and my um, and all my ads and everything is I want people to recognize my name is unusual that I want them to recognize that I'm a, a woman um, and uh, that I am uh, put together, I guess. <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily say that I'm trying to bank on on looks entirely, but I no, you're don't not even... you would never try to bank on. But like, listen, when you're I don't know, I, I say to you. Put your face on the sign. I wouldn't say that to everybody. So you could take from that whatever it means. How about that? <laughs> like it's the, by the way, it's the same reason why real estate agents always include their faces and why when they do men or women, uh, they, they, get, they go to the salon, right? They do a whole photo shoot. There's a, the reason to, when you're selling your, your name to have your face with it for right. whatever it's worth. Well, as far as the money goes, yeah, yeah. for the advertisements, um, yeah. the, the ad spends around here, they're not that expensive, but they are expensive, you know, especially mm-hmm. if you want to get a big, nice, big color ad. And it's a very intense period of time between now and election day that I have have to spend this, um, to, that I have to make these spends. Right. So I do need to gather up some money. I did get endorsed by Serve New York which is Pat Ryan's PAC. Uh, Pat Ryan is the super uh, executive director. Well, I, uh, they all, all the towns and counties have different names, uh, like supervisor versus yeah. executive or whatever. Um, but he oversees Sol- Ulster County, which is actually, Ulster County is actually where my original Dutch settlers are all buried. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, Ulster, so that's I, beautiful. Yeah. It's so gorgeous. Yeah. So, so gorgeous. But anyway, with with that endorsement, I think comes a little bit of change and uh, bank money. You know? Yeah, yeah. And then I've got online donations. People have been sending like five bucks, 50 bucks and anything. Um, I got some lawn signs from that door hangers, stamps to buy some stamps to mail uh, letters because I, I want to handwrite letters to everyone and there's not that many people I have to write hand write letters to. So I've got time <laughs> and I've got some volunteers going out and putting out lawn signs and not helping knock doors for me. But really it's about, I've got to get in front of each individual voter and how do I do that as quickly as possible in this short amount of time? You so. think you, you, obviously you think you got a chance to win this. Truthfully. <laughs> no, no, no. No, it's a it's a very very old school, good old boys town. Yeah. Um, the folks that I'm running against, one of them has a road named after his family. You know, the last name is the, his last name. <laughs> <laughs> That's tough. They've been here for hundreds of years, right? And 
they they all ha- they're afraid of change they're afraid of interlopers and carpetbaggers and i get it i get it i don't yeah. i wouldn't want that if i had this was my family and my community and everything that said the um that they're they're preventing just some real positive change in terms of uh injection of excitement about well i mean the the issue with the issue with that, and it's probably hard for anybody to hear or even agree with, that if you don't get new blood in your town, your town dies. I mean, you're well, not if you're not recreating at a at a you know repopulating your town, and especially in these places where there aren't a lot of job opportunities, your town dies. So you uh, might not yeah. like change, you might not like uh, people from other places, but if you don't have them, everybody loses. You know, let me just incestuous. ask you they, though, they you know, bring in new blood, it becomes incestuous, and yeah. I feel like, and I think this is an issue I want to talk about with everybody, so I want to bring it up here at the end with you, which is that I, I feel like the, there is just this idea at the local or any level about government's purpose and function. And what it should be is to do what's in the public's interest, to to help folks, to help the community. Pretty basic standard stuff, but a lot of people see government, whether they even realize it, as a as a way to make money, meaning... If I go run, I'm going to be able to get my friends contracts. There's going to be kickbacks. We're going to, you know, we're going to invest in this industry, which I'm already in and profit from. And so, yeah, a few people make money, but they're not really that concerned about the townspeople. And I think the those two different ways of viewing government at any level are a huge problem. Government should be what I think it should be, not a kitty for you and your friends to get contracts from the taxpayers. That cinema lady, that Kristen cinema, just yeah, but at every, at every level, at the local level, it's really that it's like, we're going to build a retirement home. Well, we don't want one. We don't want to, re- yeah. we don't want a, that, that here, but this contractor is going to get paid. And I, you know, I'm in a, a business that's going to profit from it, but it's going to be a real strain on the sewer system or something. It's not yeah. good overall. And I- if this is part of why QED is successful and why it's got such good energy and why Christian and I aren't living in a mansion and everything is we've always said that we just wanted to be appetizer rich, you know, where we could go into a restaurant and we could order an appetizer and not feel worried about that. You know, we want to be appetizer rich. We want appetizers. That's it. And so with QED, I've always said it's not ne- technically a nonprofit because um, opening a nonprofit is a bunch of rigmarole, nightmarish paperwork stuff and no thank you. But we operate it as though it's a nonprofit. Like no one's trying to get rich here. We want to have a fun, cool community space and everybody gets paid. But, you know, nobody's getting rich off this. And so maybe he and I have never operated in a way that's like, oh, we could probably be sitting high on the hog right now. But I'm also like during the pandemic when we lost our apartment and we were sleeping at QED and had all our stuff in storage and stuff. um, I had to convince him that it was that we didn't need to get another apartment that we could just sleep at QED. And he's like, but where are we going to shower? Well, how are we going to do these things? I'm like, dude, I lived in a shed with no running water. We can do this. We yeah, but I sigh, I sigh with him there. I would have been like, I didn't. I didn't. You did. I did not. I want to. Sh- no, I'm going for. I want to be shower rich. <laughs> well, yeah, as long as you know it's temporary. That, yeah. I guess that's the big key. Because what, like when I was a kid <laughs> living that, like that, this was permanent, you know, and it did not. That, that is, uh, uh, you're such an amazing human being, and uh, you, you, you and Christian are, are so lucky, lucky to have each other. And I'm really excited oh. for. <laughs> wh- huh? Are we dragging each other down? <laughs> uh, listen, I mean, marriage. We can talk about that for another ten years. All of us can, but no, I mean, you guys both bring so much to the table. Uh, but especially you in Kashakton. And so go to CambryCruise.com right now if you want to send her a few bucks to help her. Uh, follow her on Twitter at Cambry. All this is in, in today's show notes. And I'm super excited to see what's next and to find out if your hand cramps with all that letter writing. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Thanks to anyone who's listening who decides to donate and, or volunteer time or whatever. And also run for office. Uh, get involved. Think globally. Act locally. There's something right around you that you can you can help uh, change. Yeah, run for something. Thanks, Cambry. Yeah, thank you. 
Cambry Cruise, everybody. CambryCruise.com. K A M B R I C R E W S.com. And also follow her on Twitter. She's on Facebook. She's on Instagram. But she's on Twitter at Cambry. K A M B R I. She's running for office. Go donate. Give her a couple bucks. Tell her. Give her a follow on Twitter. Give her a couple bucks. And. Run for something yourself. A great conversation. Really happy to have her. I think we'll have Christian back next week, but she too can join me anytime, as can Dave Daly, who joined me earlier. And thank you to all of my guests from this week. Of course, John Carroll for the music every day and the jingles and the openings that Pete Coe cranks out. He was hanging out with us last night. We gave him big applause. He's just uh, super important to the show, and I've uh, become very attached to his work here as have many of you. All right, have a great weekend, and I will talk to you next week. I'm in Orlando on Wednesday night. I'm inviting people out in Orlando. I don't know where a few of you have responded to me, but I'm I'm headed down there for two days to do a convention to work with the Florida Education Association and the great Andrew Spar, and then also warm up the audience on Sunday night at Last Week Tonight. So watch Last Week Tonight with John Oliver on HBO, and that audience will have been... I'll have been opened for John. I introduce him on Sunday night for that episode. And uh, maybe they'll give me the gig. I want that gig. So, I don't know. I don't know who's got it right now. It's a little confusing. But I'll take it. All right, guys. Thank you very much for another great week. I love you. And sign up now if you're not a member. Or StandUpWithPete.com. John Carroll, take Stand us away, please. Stand up. Experiment if you stand up. up. Alright, we got to speak up, we got to reach up and raise your voice in every way you know how. Don't be toes up, you got to show up. Ain't no better time to do it but now. No need to pledge allegiance to no one's and try rise up. Show obedience to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide. It says stand up.